So today I'll be talking about uh, polystyrene. So this I had a debate with uh, with Ram Subramaniam on 4th July 2018. So in this talk I will be debating about uh, how polystyrene may be better than uh, the its counterpart polymyxin B. So the topics that I would be covering is a bit of background about polystyrene. And what do we understand uh, by cholesterol nephrotoxicity and how does that nephrotoxicity happens? And uh, we will look into all the studies uh, that uh, indicate to us as to what is the occurrence rate of nephrotoxicity. And we look into risk factors for nephrotoxicity. So there are six studies that look at the timing of onset of nephrotoxicity when cholesterol is being used and seven studies which look into other contributing factors in addition to the cholesterol per se causing nephrotoxicity. And uh, we, there are around uh, as you see 10 studies which look into comparison between cholesterol and polymyxin B. There are four studies looking at the clinical outcome and comparison and there are six studies which look into head to head comparison of nephrotoxicity between cholesterol and polymyxin B. And then finally take home message and uh, how did I rebut to the arguments by my uh, counterpart. So the background, so the cholestin was first introduced in 1949, it was discovered and the clinical usage of cholestin happened in 1960. So the cholestin is uh, derived or extracted from this bacillus polymixer. And if you look at cholestin, it is basically available as cholestin methane methate sodium, polystyrene methate sodium. So that is the, uh, that is a uh, molecule it is available as. So there are two variants of it, colomycin. So the dosage is 10 lakh units or 1 million, which uh, amounts to 80 milligram of polystyrene base. So when you look at uh, polystyrene base activity, it, uh, it uh, amounts to 80 milligram of polystyrene. And the other molecule is colomycin, which is available as 5 million which amounts to 400 milligram of cholestin. So the cholestin methate sodium uh, in vivo within the body it gets converted to the active ingredient. So it is a prodrug. So it basically the molecule that you administer is cholestin methate sodium and once you administer it is converted into cholestin. That's why we call it as a prodrug. So the generally the recommended dosage is uh, 9 million units as a bonus dose followed by 4.5 million units BD. So if you look at as milligram, it is more than or equal to 5 milligram per kg per day. So how does this cholestin act? So basically this cholestin uh, binds to lipopolysaccharide which is present in the cell membrane. So and it binds to the lipid moiety of lipopolysaccharide and this binding causes efflux. So efflux of it creates porin channels and there is efflux of calcium and magnesium from the cells and cells become uh, inactive. So and the bacteria and the cell death happens. So basically it acts by binding to the lipopolysaccharide within the cell membrane and the lipid moiety and causes efflux of calcium and magnesium from the bacteria and causes bacterial inactivity. So the half-life of cholestin is 1.5 to 2 hours. When given intramuscularly it is 2.75 to 3 hours. If you give it a dosage what we typically use 3 million units 8th hourly or 4.5 million units 12th hourly. The half-life extends to around 14.4 hours. That's why we dose as per the recommendation as 3 million 8th hourly or 4.5 million 12th hourly. So the dosage typically is 9 million units stat followed by 4.5 million units 12th hourly. And it is a, the, the antibacterial effects of cholestin is dependent on Cmax, so maximum concentration. So it is found that uh, AUC by MIC level should be more than 16 to 30 for its effective action against Pseudomonas or Acinetobacter. So AUC by MIC level should be more than 16 to 30 for its peak effect. And the lower levels, so if you dose it in a way that your AUC by MIC is less, I think it can confer resistance. So if you look at uh, structurally the difference between cholestin and polymyxin, essentially they both look the same except this one molecule D-leucine is uh, replaced by D-phenol. So that is the only difference which, uh, which exists at least in the molecular structure between cholestin and polymyxin B. 
So what about the pharma pharmacokinetic science of cholestein? I think what we have understood is there's lot more studies that has looked into the pharmacokinetic nature and pharmacodynamic nature of cholestein. So as I said, 1 million unit cholestein equals to 30 milligram of cholestein base activity. So that is what, so th there are studies to look at uh, what is the effective dose of cholestein. So there's lot more studies that has happened in cholestein to understand what is the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics of this. So for a 70 kg individual, so it is being found uh, considering their creatinine clearance is normal 80 ml per minute. So the target cholestein uh, steady state concentration is found to be 2 milligram per liter and that amounts to cholestein base activity of 350 milligram. So what they have found is uh, if the creatinine clearance is more than 80 ml per minute. So the concentration the th uh, of 2 milligram, if you have to achieve, it is being found if you stick to the standard dosages, only 30% of them uh, achieve concentration of 2 milligram per ml. Only 30% of the time they achieve a serum concentration of 2 milligram. Otherwise, most of the time they achieve only concentration of 0.5 milligram per ml. So what basically it means is when your real functions is normal, the dosing what is recommended if you give only 30% of the time they achieve a steady serum concentration of 2 mg per ml which is considered as an effective concentration. So that's what we have understood. So if it is a creatinine clearance of, if the creatinine clearance is less 30 to 50, then it is found that your steady serum state concentration is achieved to more than 2 mg per ml per liter uh, 50 to 80 percent of the time. So when they have renal dysfunction, the your ability to achieve that steady state concentration is much better at least 50 to 80 percent of the time you achieve that steady state concentration and if your creatinine clearance is less than 30 ml it is being found it goes the other way so your ability to maintain steady state concentration of more than 2 milligram happens only 0 to 30 percent of the time so only with at this level i think you have a better serum concentration with the dosage that is recommended in the insert so what basically this slide tells you is our uh, the, the, the understanding of the cholestein pharmacokinetics at least there has been at least some research and we have understood it well. So with polymyxin B we do not have this pharmacokinetic data. At least in cholestein we know that its uh, mechanism of action or the pharmacokinetics is little erratic and uh, what the dosage we vouch for even with that, our steady state concentration is fairly erratic. So if the, if the creatinine clearance is normal, then you know only 30% of the time with the dosage that what is recommended, you maintain steady state concentration of more than 2 mg, which is found to be an effective level. So with polymyxin B, we do not have this data also. So there is less pharmacokinetic data. And the largest data in polymyxin B is only in 24 patients. So unlike cholestein where there are multiple studies that have been done and at least they have derived at this sort of understanding of pharmacokinetics. So what about neurotoxicity? So when you give intravenous, I think 27% of the patients who receive intravenous cholestein can develop neurotoxicity and if you give intramuscular, around 7.3% of the patients can develop neurotoxicity. So what are the neurotoxicity? So patients will have dizziness. So they can have seizures, they can have ataxia, confusion, hallucinations, so they can have ptosis, they can have ophthalmophagia, they can have visual disturbance and deafness and difficulty in swallowing. So this is pictorial representation of all the neurotoxicity features that can manifest with cholestein. So as you see there are 38 articles on cholestein. So there is lot of research that has happened on cholestein. So four studies look into uh, cholestein nephrotoxicity and its correlation with the high dose, high dose cholestein and nephrotoxicity. There are 12 studies which look into the correlation of cholestein and acute kidney injury. There are eight studies which look into cholestein and the risk factors. So what is the definition of nephrotoxicity? Because I think one of the main reason people dread using cholestein is because of its nephrotoxicity. So we need to look into what that nephrotoxicity means. So when, when you are dealing in a patient with normal renal function and you are using cholestein, if the creatinine increases to more than 2 or there is 50% reduction in creatinine clearance 
or if patient needs renal replacement therapy, then they would qualify as patients who have developed nephrotoxicity due to cholestine. If patient already has pre-existing renal dysfunction, if creatinine increase is more than or equal to 50% of the baseline, then you would call it as a nephrotoxicity or 50% reduction in creatinine clearance or patient needing renal replacement therapy. So 50% reduction, uh, rise in creatinine clearance, you would qualify them as nephrotoxicity. So what is the mechanism of nephrotoxicity? I think this is important. So what we have understood is 80% of the cholestine that you give as cholestine methate sodium uh, gets absorbed within the kidney. So 80% of them get absorbed and uh, and this absorbed whatever absorbed cholestine I think that is the one which gets converted into cholestine and uh, this 80% of the one which gets converted into cholestine is excreted by non-renal mechanism. So it is not excreted by kidney. It is cholestine methate sodium which gets excreted by the kidney. It is not cholestine. The act, as soon as you give cholestine, the cholestine methate sodium has to get converted into cholestine and whatever cholestine methate sodium is not converted into cholestine is what gets excreted by the kidney and the active ingredient which is cholestine gets excreted by non-renal mechanisms which no one has understood. Okay, and the toxicity, the cholestine methate sodium is the one which causes toxicity. It's not the active cholestine. So cholestine methate sodium basically causes renal tubular necrosis and the variables or the toxic moiety is uh, two diaminobutric acid and fatty acids and these are found to be what causes toxicity. Okay. So there are studies, so this was a study by Turkish group Oskin et al which showed that they, when patients receive uh, cholestine, there is increase in the caspase 1 and 3 that causes apoptosis within the kidney and that leads to nephrotoxicity. And uh, they have suggested that there is increase in the uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase and increase in the endothelial nitric oxide synthase and they also contribute to the nephrotoxicity. And it was found there is increased levels of calpine 1 which also leads to necrotic kidney injury. So these are some of the proposed mechanisms for renal dysfunction in cholestine. So let's look into the nephrotoxicity studies. Uh, so whether the dosing is relevant in causing nephrotoxicity. So this was a study by the Spanish group. As you see the nephrotoxicity in cholestine ranges from 0 to 53.5 percent. So this was a study where cholestine uh, they received cholestine for more than 4 days in 102 patients and as you see there are 3 groups so each group with different dosing of cholestine so this was one group which received 1 million units 8th hourly in 28 patients 2 million units 8th hourly for 42 patients and 3 million international units for 8th, 8th hourly 16 patients as you see if you look at day 7 acute kidney injury so the higher the dose greater was the risk of acute kidney injury. So uh, if, uh, if you are giving 1 million units eighth hour, it was 17.9 percent and it was 43.8 percent in patients receiving 3 million units eighth hour. And acute kidney injury at the end of treatment also was slightly high in patients who receive higher dose of cholestine. So this was a study by the Turkish group again comparing the different dosages of cholestine and to see whether that had any bearing on nephrotoxicity. So this study was done in 45 patients. 15 patients got cholestine at 2.5 mg per kg 6th hourly, 20 patients got 2.5 mg per kg 12th hourly and 10 patients got low dose. As you see nephrotoxicity was high in patients who received higher dose. So it is it has a dose dependent effect. So if you are giving higher dose the risk of nephro, nephrotoxicity was found to be higher. So this was a study by Italian group Dalfin et al. Again 28 patients and comparing between high dose and low dose. So 9 million units loading dose and 4.5 million units BD which we, we have subscribed to and which, which is what we use currently, the nephrotoxicity was found to be 17.8 percent. But the good thing they found in this study was none of this patient went on to need renal replacement therapy and all these patients had recovery within 10 days. I think that is the key thing that we need to understand that although they have nephrotoxicity, I think uh, the nephrotoxicity did not lead them to undergo dialysis and, and did not lead them to go into chronic kidney disease. They all recovered. I think that is something we need to understand. So the conclusion between the dose, dosage is high dose extended interval cholestine methate sulphate, high, 
if you give high dose there is a risk of nephrotoxicity but clinical efficacy is much better and as you see the there was no the reason why i'm telling there's no significant renal toxicity is creatinine may go up but not necessarily it will lead to patients morbidity in, in the form of them needing renal replacement therapy and the recovery happened in all the patients once you notice that renal function has impaired and then you adjust the dose or stop colistin so things get better so what about the timing of colistin so there are various studies to look into at what time does the nephrotoxicity begin once you initiate colistin so as you see this was a derrick et al in 2010 so in his observation it was found that nephrotoxicity begins at 5 days after initiation of colistin so this was again a us group pog et al so that they noticed that nephrotoxicity happens within one week after initiation of colistin so this was a korean study where they found that 70% of the nephrotoxicity happened within 7 days so basically one week is the time when the nephrotoxicity sets in so this was again a us study so where they found that if you give colistin for a protracted period of time after 14 days there is 3.7 times increase in the risk of nephrotoxicity so this was a brazilian study i think this is a good study where we need to see so what they found is the median duration of nephrotoxicity was 7.5 days and again as the debate is against polymyxin b they found that both polymyxin b at the dose of more than 2 million units and colistin at the dose what we give both had two times increase in the risk which clearly tells us that one is not superior to another because both had two times increase in the risk and as you see and even in this tuon et al which is a brazilian study they found that nephrotoxicity was no different between polymyxin b and colistin so this is what uh, we need to highlight that at least from if you are to subscribe to this study there was no huge nephrotoxicity difference between polymyxin b and colistin and what they found in this study was if you use colistin along with vancomycin there was four times increase in the risk of nephrotoxicity so the falagas who has done lot of work on colistin so he suggested that it is the other nephrotoxic drugs so if you using colistin and there are other nephrotoxic drugs i think that is what will lead to increase in the risk of nephrotoxicity so these are some of the list of studies where they have looked at the timing so what we can conclude is the nephrotoxicity typically happens at around 7 days and uh, as you see if you are using additional nephrotoxic drugs i think that tends to increase your nephrotoxicity and at least if you subscribe or swear by this uh, tuon et al study it suggests that polymyxin and colistin both have nephrotoxicity and it's not like polymyxin b was very safe so i think we look into some of the studies which looked into the other risk factors so you may put patients on colistin but does, that does not mean they will develop nephrotoxicity unless there are a lot of other drugs which can add on to their nephrotoxicity so this was some of the studies which looked at what are those confounders that can lead to nephrotoxicity so this was a korean study where uh, they noticed that patients who had low albumin or concomitant nsaid usage i think they had independent they acted as independent risk factors for nephrotoxicity and they said the colistin per se would not cause so this was a uh, study which came from thailand and they found that colistin nephrotoxicity uh, happens when you are dealing with increased age or if you are giving colistin for a protracted period of time for a long duration of time or if you are using a very high dose of more than 5 mg per kg along with vancomycin so this was italian group so they noticed that colistin with its sodium per se is not a risk factor and they felt the severity of patients so if patient is very se- uh, severely ill with septic shock i think they found that that is a risk factor and per se colistimethate sodium was not considered to be a risk factor that was their observation in this italian study so this was a spanish group sorely at all so they saw uh, between 3 to 9 million units when they used the acute kidney injury happened in 25.5% at day 7 and at the end of the treatment around 49% of them had uh, acute kidney injury and the concentration minimum concentration of colistin that they noticed at day 7 was 3.33 and as you see the concentration tends to come down at the end of the treatment but although the concentration comes down aki risk continues to increase if you use colistin for a protracted period of time so the pog et al again they compared different dosage as you see the acute kidney injury was 30% when they used 3 to 5 mg per kg per day but if you use high dosage i think the risk was high and this we saw in the other previous studies also so it is dose dependent you use higher dose or supranormal dose the risk of aki was much higher 
and Pogue et al. again um, indicated that use of concomitant rifampicin increased the risk to three times uh, of nephrotoxicity. So the concomitant drugs that we use with cholestine like vancomycin, rifampicin, NSAIDs, I think that probably we should avoid because that has been found to significantly increase the risk of nephrotoxicity. So and uh, this was another study by uh, Korean group where they said low albumin also was a risk factor and calcineurin inhibitor which you typically use for transplant setting. So that also contributes to nephrotoxicity and this was a US group which said if you use contrast or more than two nephrotoxic drugs there is 6.5 times increase in the risk of nephrotoxicity. So all these studies around 8 to 10 studies tell you that concomitant drugs is what adds on to the nephrotoxicity of cholestine rather than cholestine per se. But obviously, if you are watching that cholestine causes nephrotoxicity, it is the dosage. If you are using supranormal dosage, I think that can lead to more nephrotoxicity. So as we understood that cholestine is a concentration drug, so it depends on the Cmax. Maximum concentration determines its effectiveness. And they found that maximum concentration of cholestine happens at around 7 hours. But for polymyxin B, it happens pretty rapidly. So it, for concentrations to achieve maximum levels, it takes around 7 hours for cholestine. And as I already mentioned in the uh, how the cholestine acts, cholestine methate sodium is what gets excreted in the kidney. So as I said, as soon as you give cholestine methate sodium, and that is what you administer it as. So it takes about hours to get converted to cholestine. So which means, so until that duration, all this cholestine methate sodium, whatever kidney's ability, they get excreted. So it's only the small portion of cholestine methate sodium which gets converted to cholestine because it takes few hours, which means in that hours all this cholestine methate sodium gets excreted in the kidney. So, so now we look, so we have looked into cholestine as to what is its nephrotoxicity and what are the other drugs that lead to nephrotoxicity and whether it has any dose dependent effect on the nephrotoxicity. Now we look into head to head comparison of cholestine and polymyxin. So if you have to compare cholestine versus polymyxin B, there are around 4 studies. So this was a study by Brazilian group Oliveira. So they compared between cholestine and polymyxin B to see which is superior. As you see, this is a clinical outcome study. 41 patients received cholestine and 41 patients received polymyxin B. And if you look at hospital survival, there was no difference between cholestine and polymyxin B. And uh, hospital survival, there was no difference. Hospital mortality, there was no difference. 30 day mortality, there was no difference between cholestine and polymyxin B. So they did multivariate analysis. And even polymyxin type, whether you use cholestine or polymyxin B, it had no correlation in the mortality. So this was a study by Tuan et al. And cholestine methate sodium, as you see, hospital mortality was 45.8 polymyxin. So no difference. Even in this study, they found no difference between cholestine and polymyxin. So this was a study again by Brazilian group, Rigato et al. As you see, there is no difference. It was not statistically significant between 30 day mortality no difference between cholestine, cholestine methate sodium and polymyxin B. <clears throat> so this was a study by P et al which is from a US group. So 121 received cholestine methate sodium and 104 and this is a striking study where you see hospital mortality was more in polymyxin group and that was statistically significant. So this goes on to show that cholestine with regards to clinical efficacy if you have to vouch for this study may be more superior to polymyxin B in terms of achieving clinical cure rates. I think that was something which was striking in this study. So the conclusions what we can make from four to five studies as four studies is clinical efficacy at least the three studies showed no difference between polymyxin B and cholestine methate sodium and one study showed that cholestine is superior to polymyxin B. So in conclusion we can say there was no significant difference between polymyxin B and cholestine methate. So now so we know that clinical cure rates, there is no difference. If at all, if you have to watch for the P at all study, it says polymyxin B may be inferior to cholestine clinical. So let's look at nephrotoxicity to see which is superior, whether cholestine or polymyxin. So there are five studies. So Oliveira at all, so it looked into nephrotoxicity. As you see, <clears throat> there was twofold, uh, you call it as nephrotoxicity when there was twofold increase in serum creatinine after the initiation of the drug. So cholestine methate sodium nephrotoxicity was 26%, polymyxin 27%. So no statistically diff significant difference between them. To one at all, again it showed there was no statistically significant difference in nephrotoxicity between cholestine methate sodium and polymyxin B when they looked in uh, around 100 and 
odd patients and that was not statistically significant and multivariate analysis showed that hazard ratio of nephrotoxicity when used cholesterol was 1.74 and the p at all again you see there is no statistical difference statistically significant difference in nephrotoxicity between cholestin methate sodium and polymyxin b so it was not significant and in p at all that excluded patients who had creatinine more than 1.5 mg per deciliter so this study from us uh, akajab bar here they found that nephrotoxicity was little more in cholestin methate sodium 60.4 as compared to 41.8 and that was statistically significant multivariate analysis again showed increased hazard ratio of nephrotoxicity in cholestin group so if you look at this whatever four studies there was one study which showed that nephrotoxicity was more in cholestin so this study also showed increased nephrotoxicity with cholestin regarded at all from brazilian group so 81 patients they they uh, checked the cholestin base activity so it was 300 mg and they found acute kidney injury was 38.3% in cholestin and 12.7 so there were two studies uh, akjabaka what is Ak akaja bar study and rigato study both showed that uh, acute kidney injury was more in cholestin and multivariate analysis showed in this particular study that cholestin was an independent risk factor for nephrotoxicity so but there are distinct disadvantages of uh, polymyxin b so you may end up using polymyxin because out of uh six studies at a four to five studies there were two studies which said that cholestin does cause nephrotoxicity but the three studies said there was no difference between cholestin and polymyxin but if you end up using polymyxin you cannot use because in india the commonest infections that we see is uti in uti you cannot use polymyxin because it has a very poor urinary concentration that is something i want each one of you to remember that if you are dealing with uti which is very common in india and if you use polymyxin b we have understood that urinary levels are not reached so urinary concentration is very poor but cholestin methate sodium reaches at least 65% of urinary concentration and and uh, as i said cholestin can be used as neps nebulizations for patients with uh, ventilatory associated tracheitis or vaps but cholest uh, polymyxin we cannot use as neps and uh, for uh, multi drug resistant acinetobacter we have used cholestin as intrathecal and polymyxin cannot be used as intrathecal so that is a i think that is another big setback of polymyxin that you cannot use nebulizations you cannot use intrathecal so the conclusions that i would make about nephrotoxicity is polymyxin b possibly confers little safety because in five studies there were two studies which said polymyxin had less nephrotoxicity possible possibly confers safety but only one one of six studies showed this effect i would say two because the gatotel and akjabaga both of them showed uh that polymyxin b was safer than cholestin so let's look at this most recent article that came in april 2017 this was again to see at nephrotoxicity in patients with or without cystic fibrosis treated with polymyxin b so in this study what i want to highlight is if you look at acute kidney injury so this was only cystic fibrosis patients treated between cholestin and polymyxin acute kidney injury again there was no difference between cholestin and polymyxin b but what i want you to highlight here is the peak serum creatinine so when you are using cholestin serum creatinine takes around 6 days and we saw even in the previous studies around 7 days was the time when creatinine peaks which means by then i would have achieved bacterial clearance because i would have at least conferred the benefit for at least 6 days i would have treated the patient and i would have achieved clinical cure rates or bacteriological clearance but when you are dealing with polymyxin it was found in the study that the peak serum creatinine happens at 3 days only which means at 3 days only you may have to stop the drugs or you may have to reduce the dose so you would be suspicious how effective would be the cure rate because of your increase in creatinine that was statistically significant and this study also showed that the concomitant use of loop diuretics and diabetes um, added as a hazard ratio i mean that increased the hazard ratio of nephrotoxicity along with cholestin okay and what they found is if patients have higher serum creatinine and we saw in that in that second or third slide has a protective effect on acute kidney injury in cholestin why does that happen because if creatinine is higher then cholestin methate sodium does not get excreted in the kidney there is more cholestin methate sodium in the circulation which gets converted into active cholestin and we know active cholestin is not nephrotoxic it is cholestin methate sodium and cholestin methate sodium becomes nephrotoxic when it has a renal excretion because it causes renal tubular necrosis 
as it gets excreted so and and it produces toxins that uh, diamino butyric acid and fatty acids so if creatinine is high it has been found that cholestin has a renal protective effect so these are two interesting findings that creatinine takes much longer time to peak and it ha- it may have a protective effect because of because of its pro drug because of the nature it is that it's a pro drug so the summary of uh, my uh, debate which would uh, you know which i would support use of cholestin is there are too many confounders to attribute to cholestin hepatotoxicity so as you see most of the studies uh, they do not say cholestin per se is not ne- nephrotoxic it is the severity of uh, illness on all the concomitant drugs that you may be using which may enhance its toxicity and per se so there are too many confounders to attribute everything to cholestin as nephrotoxic and if you are having good discipline with cholestin so if you are monitoring creatinine regularly i think it is a very safe drug and if you dose it appropriately if you monitor renal function tests carefully and you do dose adjustment and we have seen that that if you do have a good discipline while choosing cholestin we know that it it does not lead to a situation where you would have to use renal replacement therapy or it does not lead to a stage where you will end up in chronic kidney disease so i think with a good systematic way of using cholestin i think nephrotoxicity can be mitigated and as you see there is no robust evidence as of now to say cholestin is superior to polymyxin b as you see the clinical outcomes in fact if you watch to that pay at all study the clinical cure rates was better with cholestin than polymyxin b and other studies showed there was no difference and there was no robust evidence to say that yes cholestin is more nephrotoxic because out of six studies only two studies said it is little nephrotoxic otherwise the other four studies did not say it was nephr- there was no difference and cholestin most importantly fares better because of clinical experience there are more studies done in cholestin and number of patients treated with cholestin are lot more there are lot more studies so it is a proven drug and it has been it is being used for more than close to a decade so we have more experience with cholestin so i think i would uh, subscribe to cholestin as a better drug because of the experience on the track record we have and the, another important limitation of cholestin is we cannot use it for uti because of poor serum co- i mean ut- cholestin can be used for uti but polymyxin cannot be used for uti because of poor urinary concentrations and cholestin i can use it as neps and i can use it as intrathecal which polymyxin i cannot use and the cost poly- polymyxin may be slightly expensive than cholestin so cholestin may be a little cheaper than polymyxin i think this also has to be factored in as one of the reason why cholestin fares better than polymyxin b so this was the talk i would uh, that i initially gave and then obviously my opponent came up with all the other distinct advantages of polymyxin b so the rebuttal in the rebuttal slides again i had to reiterate this particular slide which is self explanatory so if you look at all the polymyxin b studies and polymyxin b nephrotoxicity you would see that polymyxin b also has a nephrotoxicity up to 66% so these are all the list of studies and you see all the studies say that polymyxin b has nephrotoxicity and one of the study it says polymyxin b also has nephrotoxicity as high as 66% and if people would not be convinced with this f- staggering figure look at the clinical response i think with polymyxin b if you look at the hospital mortality it was as high as 74.3 and in hospital hospital mortality in this particular study was 63% which means possibly this group of patients had clinical failure so i think this slide one slide would convince you all that its clinical efficacy is not as good as cholestin and uh, we cannot say polymyxin b is free of nephrotoxicity because all the studies say that it has nephrotoxic effect so i think and if you look at this p at all study as i have already shown you if you look at hospital mortality it was much higher in polymyxin b which tells you that clinical failure rates may be higher in polymyxin b and we may be much better off in achieving clinical cure rates with cholestin and that was statistically significant and another study which favors our use is because this tuan et al study which clearly said polymyxin b and cholestin together both together also have two times increase in the risk of nephrotoxicity and between them there is absolutely no difference so and we know polymyxin b also can be nephrotoxic and this is another substantiation for my argument that polymyxin b has a very poor urinary concentration in india we deal with more utis so we cannot afford to use polymyxin b 
and uh, polystyrene methate sodium 65% urinary concentration and this is preferable because we can use it as NEPS and intrathecal. And look at the number of studies, polystyrene there are around 38 studies. So which means there is more proven track record, more studies to convince ourselves that this is a better drug as opposed to polymixin B there are less than 10 studies that are currently available. So we need possibly more studies and more head to head comparisons to really convince ourselves to prove that polymixin B is anywhere close to cholestine. And if you look at this uh, other study which again I reiterated that peak serum creatinine it is it will take 6 days for cholestine uh, in, in patients where cholestine is being used to achieve this peak serum creatinine as opposed to polymixin B where it will go up within 3 days. So which means I have more time for me to use cholestine and achieve bacterial clearance when you compare to polymixin B where if creatinine goes up within 3 days so then obviously I have to curtail using the drug and maybe my clinical cure rates also may get affected because of that. And so this was a study we did in our uh, own ICU uh, and this we have sent it for publication so it is in the peer review. As you see we did a study of 301 patients who are mechanically ventilated and 41 patients that is 13.6% of the patient had polystyrene only sensitive infections and predominantly these infections were seen in neurosurgical patients and our mortality was around 29.2% in patients who had polystyrene only sensitive infections which is MDR infections only sensitive to polystyrene. And uh, in this mortality 50% of the mortality happened in sepsis patients group. And if you look at the breakup of organisms, Acinetobacter constituted 60.9% uh, of our patients followed by Klebb pneumonia, Pseudomonas and E. coli. So all these were only sensitive to polystyrene. And uh, our DPT cultures was the predominant growth of polystyrene only sensitive organisms which was 70.7% followed by UTI and pus and blood culture. And what was our nephrotoxicity? So we had to walk the talk. So we looked at our nephrotoxicity and as you see the nephrotoxicity was only 9.75% and uh, here we had excluded the patients who were on mannitol to attribute it to only polystyrene. So which is acceptable 9.7% as you saw in all the other studies, I think it was much higher. So what I am trying to say is our nephrotoxicity was less and none of them went on to need RRT and, uh, and none of them went on for chronic kidney disease. Okay? And we define nephrotoxicity as creatinine more than 1.5 times. And as I said, intrathecal usage of polystyrene is very useful because we did publish this article where we have used polystyrene intrathecally and we have achieved cure rates and this we have published. So had we stuck to polymyxin then we would not have had this option of uh, saving this patient where polystyrene was life saving because we did use intrathecal and we know had we relied on polymyxin we could not have used that in this patient. So I would end my argument uh, by a famous quote from this patient, this person Pierre Simon Laplace. So you know the Laplace learn. So he is commemorated on a French stamp that was issued in 1955. So I would end my talk with this quote. So if you have to argue that polymyxin is superior, so the weight of evidence for an extraordinary claim must be proportioned to its strangeness. I would only say if you say polymyxin is superior to cholestin, I would say that it is uh, it has to be proportioned to its strangeness. So there is no scientific argument for that. It, it should be only the strange argument. And what I would agree is what we know is not much, what we do not know is immense. So these were the two quotes made by Laplace. I think both quotes are applicable to this argument today because I think we need to understand more about polymyxin. I think that's what I would say. So thank you very much.